Hey, Jeff. Hey, what's up? How are you? Good, yourself? I'm doing okay. Did you go to Wendy's before a Knicks game when you were first in New York, first year as a coach? McDonald's. Oh. so Paulie? That's how I celebrated getting hired. I, uh, I signed my contract and uh, <laughs> stopped in the drive-thru on the way uh, up the West Side Highway. I don't even think that McDonald's is still there, but, yeah, that, uh, the number one combo never tasted so good. But there's a Wendy's across the street, though, and and Paulie said that he saw you there one time. And oh, out- it's very possible. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Get the chili? Are you kidding me? I'm sure. <laughs> uh, that's all I wanted to ask you, Jeff. I just wanted yeah. to just find out about that. Uh, are the Knicks a good team or just a good story? No, they're 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 a good team that maxed out. Uh, the talent at hand in the regular season. And we see this every once in a while where expectations for playoff success rises uh, because of what happened in the regular season. But there's no question Atlanta has more, more offensive talent. Um, The depth of their talent is better. That doesn't mean the Knicks can't win, but I picked Atlanta. I thought they were a slight favorite going in uh, just because I think they have, just more weapons offensively. Yeah, I picked Atlanta as well. I was also wondering about the atmosphere because you coached in New York and you coached, these were big games, uh, playoff games, but can you, did you ever, were you ever aware of the surroundings, you know, fan behavior while you were coaching? Not not necessarily the behavior, but the the intensity and passion of the crowd, absolutely. And I think the garden was never louder than it was in game two uh, of this series. I mean, it was overwhelming. I've never seen a crowd that I remember in the garden standing an entire half. And it looked like the whole place was standing up uh, the entire second half. And I think, um, so the crowd intensity and passion, yes, aware of, I'll tell you, I, I am a little, I'm very disturbed though by some of these incidents that, uh, fans becoming emboldened uh, to try to, you know, feel like they can spit on, uh, dump popcorn on. Uh, that That's really disturbing, though. But I don't know what it is, Jeff. It, are the fans any different? I, I mentioned social media plays a role here, but are they more passionate? Uh you know, people trying to use pandemic, like, oh, you're being let out of the house. They Like, you're not going to your your job today in spitting on somebody or pouring popcorn on something. Like, I, I don't know what the reasoning is behind this. Well, I, I would say probably at a lot of places, uh, alcohol plays a, uh, a major factor. I'm also disappointed in the, you know, they're banning them from the arena. First of all, that's of no consequence because people can come right back in. It's not like the people charged or, perceptually they're banned they can't get in it's not like there's facial recognition and they're get, they can't come in we don't even know who they are uh particularly with the trey young incident spitting on someone he should have the person should have been arrested like there there has to be harsher consequences for these type of actions and you know but you're right like it's not that much different some of the things said to patrick ewing um at road arenas, I got to say, like back in the night, it, it, it would, it, you know, it, today people were going to be, would be like stunned at how bad it was at times. So um, I, I don't know other than alcohol, how you can explain, you know, these bad behaviors, but certainly um, a few people just, you know, it's criminal activity is what it is. And I don't know how Patrick was able to just internalize that. I mean, Trey Young getting spit on. And, you know, you just – and you got to play a game. Um, I, and I – you know, we, we've all been down there with press row and you hear what, what is said or a football game or basketball or baseball. Have you ever had to say anything to any of your players? Like, hey, stay in the moment or don't let it bother you? Uh, I don't remember doing that, Dan, but I, I got to say, like, some of these things, 
like you shouldn't have. You know, they have security behind the bench. I think this is where basketball is a little bit different than football. Football, there's more separation between the fans and, you know, the the players. And in basketball, particularly when we're, you know, not in a COVID season, I mean, they're right on top of you. And the things they say or could do, um, you know, make the basketball players much more vulnerable to to things. And so now I, I don't remember ever saying it, but I, I got to say that sometimes I was actually stunned that they didn't react more often. You know, the, the idea when I think Westbrook went after somebody, um, I remember way back, Vernon Maxwell went in the stands yeah. after somebody. You know, I know they shouldn't do it, but until you're in that situation where people, you know, can say these things because they know they're being protected by, you know, the rules and the league will actually, you know, protect the fan more oftentimes than they protect the players. Um, I think it's try they're trying to get better at it, but we still have a long way to go. He's Jeff Van Gundy of the Mothership. He'll be on the call, Nets and Celtics. Uh, anyway, the Nets don't... i got to say, I love when you say Mothership. That just makes me laugh <laughs> each and every time. Go ahead. I've been saying it for decades. I, and I know. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. Anyway, the Nets don't reach the NBA Finals. Well, yeah, there's a way. Uh, but th- to me, they're the prohibitive favorite. I think the path in the Eastern conference, you know, they're going to have to play an outstanding Milwaukee team, most likely in the next round. Uh, if they're to advance, if they're advanced past the Celtics, and then they've got to face a team. They most likely have to face a terrific Philadelphia team. Who's great defensively. And with a power post-up player that they really don't match up great with. So yeah, there's, there's a, a course, uh, and a path that they don't, uh, certainly, because I think the competition at the top half of the East, uh, those top three teams could all advance uh, easily to the NBA Finals. If I gave you the Lakers or the field in the West? Wow. If you would have said that before the playoffs, <laughs> I would have said the field. Yeah. You know, now, like I see them ratchet up that defense. uh you know, if they're if they're able to advance past Phoenix, you know, Portland or Denver, Denver particularly because they're injured, I could I can't see either one of those teams beating them. So, you know, it's their defense, Dan. I mean, they're yeah. they're big and they're tough, and they guard. And and when Anthony Davis, you know, gets big numbers, and you got James. Uh, you know, neither one had a great first half, but they come out in that second half and they just pound, you know, a really good Phoenix team. So I'd have to take L.A. now that you said, uh, you know, if you'd pose that same question to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably take L.A. What if the Clippers bow out opening round? What kind of ramifications fall out, any, if any? Yeah, uh, unknown, because I think Kawhi Leonard could be a free agent. Uh if he chooses to be, um, you know, obviously I, I don't really understand their messaging. Um, when people asked him after the second loss, is there any concern? And they said, no concerns. And I'm like, like, that's far different from saying we're not panicked. We're still confident, but to not have any concern. I mean, Luka Doncic in and of itself is a concern down two O is a concern. Um, you know, their inability to, to guard in a manner in which, like, they should be a great defensive team. They have every component you need to be a great defensive team. So if I was their players, I, I, I think the proper messaging would be, yeah, still confident but concerned. We need to be more urgent. Uh, you know, we need to play better. And I think this started with their attitude towards the last couple games of the regular season where, you know, they lost, I don't want to say on purpose, but they certainly weren't playing to win. And the West is hard. Like Dallas is no joke. I mean, I think they beat them by 50 earlier in the season. So obviously 
uh, this is a really good team, uh, a dangerous offensive team, and they've got a preeminent star in in Doncic. Is there a younger a young player you would take over Luca to start your team? Well, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but I'll give you first choice. And if I get to, I get Doncic, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with like like. The way the you know what impresses me about him is as he's improved his shooting later in the year, like when he gets into the lane, he's so big, so strong, with such great vision. There's no great way to handle him in the two man game. Like in the pick and roll, you can trap him, and he can see over the trap, and he's a willing passer, and they have great shooting around him. Uh, if you drop deep in the lane with your big He's so big and strong that he takes it deep and he can either finish or make every pass necessary. And if you switch, particularly if you play a traditional center, he just obliterates those guys. So there is no good coverage for him. And I think he's more dialed in. He's not a a, a, a good individual defender per se, but he's more dialed in defensively because he knows that ultimately you have to guard to win. And so, I think this guy is a, you know, a, just a great, great player. I mean, he, if you put him as your MVP in many in, in a ballot, he, I mean, he's going to be in the top eight, no question. Yeah, he might turn out to be like Mike Trout, where he's always in the conversation for MVP. The question is, is he going to win championships? Just like Mike Trout. Mike Trout is, you know, obviously one of the great players, but. He's not winning a championship anytime soon, and and Luca may have a situation that's similar to that. Well, so much of winning a championship, as you know, Dan, is who you play with and who you play against. Some some players were just born at the wrong time, and even though they had good players around them, they just didn't have you know enough around them to win it all. So, you know, Doncic, I think they have a very good team. I, I know. Uh, they got off to a bad start this year. You know, Porzingis injury, I think, had an impact. I think Doncic didn't shoot the ball particularly well. But since Rick Carlisle has gone to Richardson off the bench, starting hard away with Finney Smith, Kleba, Porzingis, and Doncic, that starting lineup is big, it's versatile, and it has a lot of answers at both ends of the floor. You coached against Jordan. Later, Jordan, you coached against Kobe, you coached against LeBron, a young LeBron. Game plan wise, who did you who did you figure out a little bit better than the other two? Mm, there's no there, there wasn't there's really no figuring out great players. I think what you try to do with all great players, Dan, is you can't give them everything. Um, so for instance, where we always started off with game planning against great players, you know, first of all, O'Neal was by far the hardest guy. Like there was no game plan for the power of O'Neal. So, but on those perimeter players, what you try to do is take away transition layups and try to take away free throw attempts. The pull up game, you know, some of the threes we see LeBron James making now off the dribble, he made one in game two against uh, Phoenix, you know, left corner off the dribble fade. There's nothing you can do with that. you got to take away layups. you got to take away free throws. And the harder you make, them, make it on great players in the half court, they try to figure out, all right, I got to get out and transition more. I got to get to the offensive boards more. So you've got to fight them in the effort areas. But there's truly – no way to stop him, but you can't give him everything. So for James, you know, like you can't give him 30 points and double digit assists. Like you're, he's going to get probably one or the other, but you can't give him both. It's always great to talk to you, Jeff. Uh, have fun tonight. It's the Nets and the Celtics. That'll be at 8:30 Eastern on the Mothership, and uh, Sunday's game will be Suns Lakers at 3:30 Eastern on ABC. If you can slip in Mothership tonight, that'd be kind of nice. Well, I think we're on ABC tonight. So oh, you, you are. Have to, I think we are. So um, I think tonight, yeah, it's an 8.30 game because I think the other games are on the mothership 
Uh, Knicks come on at seven, and I believe at nine thirty is uh, Dallas. Right, so two games on the mothership, one on ABC, <laughs> and I if I I am going to get mothership in tonight, and Mark Jackson will probably uh, reprimand me immediately, but that's all right. Yeah, I can I can handle that. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about Mark Jackson. Mike Breen's a Hall of Famer. I'd worry about him. But, uh, uh, hey. Yes, he is. Great to talk to you, Jeff. Uh, th- All right, take Thanks care. for joining us. That's Jeff Van Gundy. We'll take a break. Uh, back after this.